My partner on this project, Era Weber, always kids that shooting in Zimbabwe is 12 parts of impossible. The government requires you to have a license to make a film, but there's no way that you could realistically get a license. So you have to spend an awful lot of time dodging the authorities, evading the police, we became experts at what we call drive-by shootings, where I would drive really, really slowly as Errol was filming along the street, and then if people began to notice, we'd speed away. Or in rural areas, we would give gifts, which means bribes, to traditional chiefs so that the villagers would feel comfortable. And that was only the political side of it. Logistically, it was an extremely challenging film. There was virtually no gasoline in the country while we were there. So if we didn't keep a good stock, we wouldn't be able to go the next day to shoot because you could go to 15 gas stations and 12 places on the black market and still not find fuel. Then there was the problem of power. We were shooting in rural areas and there was no power to dump our footage or to charge our batteries. So Arrow would have to walk 15 minutes each way, sometimes twice a day, in order to find power, which we could sometimes locate in the next village. One day we were filming a concert that the band was giving in town and smack in the middle of a song, the electricity went out and we lost the entire recording. Or we come home at night and desperately need to recharge our batteries. And then the power grid would totally collapse and for the next 18 hours we couldn't recharge them, so we were stuck. But I have to admit that we sort of liked it. Because what's life without a good challenge? The band became a very major part of my life and the lives of everybody else who worked on the film. And they still are. Errol is kind of an older brother, especially to the boys because he's about their age. And I'm more or less a second mother. For all of them, music was and remains an incredibly important force. And it's not just in the traditional sense of it gave them a chance to express themselves, but being part of the band gave them tremendous confidence and experience. Being part of the band gave them a chance to travel. And you could see, I think, in the film how they grow during the time that they're in America. And it also opened other doors. So Farai, for example, the piano player, fell in love with the entire process of filmmaking, bought a camera, learned to edit, and is making short films. Marvelous is everybody's bad boy got a chance to train to work on radio. The most wonderful example of this, though, is Goodwill, Honest, and Energy, the three band members who always wanted to go on to higher education. Last week, they were living in Zimbabwe pretty much the way we depicted them in the film. Now, they just arrived in the United States because universities in Florida, Kansas, and New York not only saw their academic records, but saw Itemba and were so moved that they offered them scholarships. So here they are. Say hi to Korea. Hi, hi Korea. Korea. When people see the disabled, they have a tendency to feel pity, which is a lovely human emotion, but it doesn't help people who are blind or deaf or in wheelchairs. What's extraordinary about the members of Liana is they know that pity does not help them. What they want is the same thing that all the rest of us want. Every human being wants dignity, and respect because they can forge them into very good lives. Ultimately, I didn't make this film though to send a message, but I made it as a tribute to eight extraordinary young people who I guess I came to love a great deal. And I learned an important lesson from them because I live in a world in which people spend an awful lot of time saying, we can't, I can't. And they taught me that I was wrong and that we were all wrong. Because if despite all of the obstacles, they can, why can't we? And that was a humbling message that I hope everyone who watches this film will take away with them.